All right. Hey. No more enemies activating. Rasalka's gonna move and brace. Our last two allies are going to potentially shoot somebody. And we're gonna go to the salvage screen. And this is, again, another benefit of defend-based missions, is all you have to do is survive round 10. And then you win. As long as there's enough buildings left, and as long as, you know, you haven't been completely wiped out. Defend bases are fairly easy to succeed on. Okay. There we go. Mission successful. Mission successful. That's what I just said. Okay, so, this is the post-mission briefing. It reminds you who you are working for. It reminds you who you were attacking. It reminds you what kind of mission it was. None of that really matters. Over here, you get the same information, but more meaningful, because it shows that we got exactly two reputation with Republic of the Sphere, and planetary government doesn't have reputation because it's kind of a filler faction. So, the Mercenary Review Board. That's the first thing I'm going to talk about. Um, the skull is just kind of decoration, as far as I know. I, I have never noticed any meaningful change to it. So, yeah. In any case, you see your rating, you see the bar filling up, and more importantly, you see the star. So... The more stars you get, the more you benefit from your mercenary reputation. One way this manifests is in the hiring hall, you gain access to better quality mech warriors that you can hire. In the shops, I think it increases the value or the, uh, the chance of getting higher quality gear. But I can't say for sure because, um, yeah, it's a, it's a system that doesn't really uh, talk. Like, you, you don't get a lot of feedback about exactly what the MRB rating is doing. But one thing it definitely does is it has an impact on the types of events you can have pop up between missions when you're passing time. Whether it be traveling or waiting for repairs or what have you. This can impact what can happen there, to a degree. Morale. Exactly what you would expect. It's showing your current morale after the mission. If you fail missions, your morale will drop. If you succeed at missions, your morale will improve. Period. Now then, the more interesting part. The money. This part of the screen, this this slide of the post-mission briefing is all about the sea bills. Starting off, top right-hand corner. This is your current funds before the mission. At the bottom here is the current funds that are going to be added to that amount after the mission briefing. So that is 600,000 sea bills about that will be added to our 1.1 million. So we will have 1.7 million or so. The way that this number was reached is broken down up here. If all you care about is the total number that you made off the mission, you can, get, you can just straight up click next. Look at that, that's the payout, click next. If you failed the mission, if you, especially if you had a bad, uh, a bad faith failure, this will almost certainly be negative. Uh, if it's a good faith effort, you might have actually still made a positive C bill amount. But if it's bad faith, it will 100% be negative. Also, if you dropped too strong of a lance on too low of a rated mission, you can actually lose money by dropping on missions. Or alternatively, if you negotiated for like no payout, just minimum C bills, and you dropped an advanced, you know, high value lance, you can actually get negative payouts. Um, I know if you're familiar with Baradul and his playthroughs, he likes getting the toys. I can't fault him for that. He sells and scraps to make up the difference. 
I just can't afford to do that in the challenge run for the most part. In any case, here we go. This is the full breakdown. First of all, every objective that you succeeded is clearly labeled with success next to it. This includes hidden results. We did not destroy either of the reinforcement lances in their entirety, so you'll see it's not listed as a potential optional objective. The hidden objectives, as far as I know them, the only hidden objectives are destroy a reinforcement lance in its entirety, destroy all enemies in a mission where the extra enemies are not part of the briefing, surprise drop reinforcements, destroying um, the support lances that can be generated by the rogue tech support lance system if you have it enabled, um, ensuring all allies survive in certain missions. I don't think that ensure all allies survive is actually a listed objective in most of those, unless it is mandatory, like if it's a primary objective, which actually I'll, I think I already mentioned that, but just as a quick pin in it, uh, if it has, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I did, but if it has the hexagon around the X or the cross or whatever you want to call it, then that's a primary objective. You have to complete those to not fail the mission. Whereas if it's this like plus sign with a dot in the middle, crosshair kind of thing, those are optional objectives. So, destroy all turrets. Destroy all enemies. Ensure all allies survive. If they're not specifically listed in an objective, or in the mission, bri like in the mission briefing in the in-game interface, you can still get bonus payout for doing those things as objectives that you can optionally complete, but they're not gonna really be listed as optional. Now, destroy local government vanguard. We lost one reputation with the faction we can't lose reputation with, but our contract payment was increased by a flat 50,000. This is more impactful the less C bills you negotiate for and more impactful, the lower the rating of the mission, because that 50,000 does not change, as far as I know it, um, unless they changed it for the handheld rework to actually scale with the difficulty of the mission. But at the end of the last playthrough I was doing, I was dropping on, you know, five plus goal missions, and I was still only getting 50,000 C bills as the bonus pay. This is the same payout for destroying the optional, um, you know, destroying the hidden objectives, the turrets, or the destroying the reinforcement lances. But I believe last time I played with um, support lances enabled, I believe support lances have a higher payout based on what exact support lance settings you have. Because there is the new, brand new kill squad support lances. Um, which definitely is that support lances are dangerous. If you want to learn how to play rogue tech with them enabled, by all means have fun, but definitely don't do the kill squad support lances until you are quite uh, capable in the game. They would, they will just ruin your day. Now then ensure all buildings survive. You'll notice we failed it. You'll notice it also says contract payment decreased by 25%. This is more impactful the more C bills you negotiated for. If we had succeeded at ensure all buildings survive, it would have been a percentage increase. So the more C bills you negotiate for, the more valuable the ensure all buildings survive becomes. Likewise, the returning patrol that activates the, uh, the turrets, or in this case, the VTOLs that were protecting the base, this is also always a 10% increase if you succeed at it. Now, this one, I'm fairly certain if you fail, you don't lose C bills, you just don't get the turrets or whatever. So, 
the ensure all buildings survive is the only one that's you benefit if you succeed and you lose money if you fail. Now then, moving on to the important part. Drop costs deducted. So this is the mechs and vehicles that we put down on the mission just to put them down on the mission without them doing anything cost us 70,000 sea bills. This is calculated by a function of how much value of weapons, components, electronics, gear, engines, armor, etc. The more valuable of stuff that you put into a mech, the more expensive it is to drop that mech, which is then further modified by a, well, modifier that each chassis has. It's one of the advantages of primitive mechs because a primitive mech has a lower than one, you know, 1.0 modifier. So it's cheaper, even after you've upgraded it, to drop a primitive mech with the same equipment as a non-primitive mech. Just like if you're dropping a clan mech or an omni mech, they always have above a 1 times 1.0 drop cost modifier. Multiplier, that's what it is, multiplier. So it's more expensive to drop a omni mech or a clan mech or a Star, uh, Star League Defense Force Lost Tech mech chassis even though it's carrying the exact same identical equipment to a not fancy high-tech, lost-tech, clan-tech thing. It doesn't matter, like, the, the modifier doesn't matter, it doesn't care what you put in the mech. The modifier is just for that chassis. Whereas the actual drop cost of dropping that mech is a function of both the chassis multiplier as well as the individual things in the mech, as well as how much armor and structure it has. It, I, think it's uh, I think it's cheaper to drop a damaged mech than it is to drop a fully repaired mech. Don't quote me on that one, but everything up to that point is true. <laughs> now then, ammo costs deducted, that's right. That's the... One little lie that I told during the mission was there was no reason to not fire the tank's AC-10. Slight lie, because you do pay for the ammo you use to restock the ammo bins. So every time you shoot an AC-10, you are paying for that AC-10 round to restock it after the mission. But keep in mind, we fired quite a few missiles and a bunch of AC-10, LB-10 stuff, and we only paid 14,000 sea bills rounded up. So, not that big of a deal. Heat sinks. This is one consideration for dropping in a hot biome versus dropping in a cold biome. If you have heat sinks, you're paying the same amount for dropping the same amount of heat with the cooling systems that you have, regardless of what kind of biome you're in. So as far as I have been able to tell, and as far as I know, if you are in a cold environment and you generate 60 heat, and then you cool down 60 heat, you're gonna have to pay for that. But firing any weapons at all is going to generate heat. I believe I'm I'm under the impression from what I have seen you actually save money in this little line of the ex you know of the finances of the expenses you save a little bit of money dropping in a cold environment compared to a neutral environment compared to a hot environment but it's negligible it is completely negligible um, this, this amount doesn't really start going up until you are, like, firing four or five PPCs in one turn kind of stuff. Like, 
just firing a bunch of lasers, to, it's fine. You're you're not unless you're like riding the red line constantly, or you're actually like running twenty double heat sinks, <laughs> or if you're running proto heat sinks. But that's a that's a future topic. Um, this this and the ammo cost. They don't really go up that much, but they really hurt when you lose a mission or when you negotiate for like no money. That if if 14 plus 16, you know, 30, 31,000 ish is half or a third or a quarter even of what you negotiated for. In addition to the drop cost, making it a total of like 100,000 sea bills and you negotiated for less than 100,000 sea bills, it feels kind of bad to see the negative there. But as long as you negotiated for salvage and not for uh, reputation, then even if you have a negative sea bill balance, you'll get stuff that you might be able to sell. Why is that orange? Little bit of lore. The Wolf's Dragoons is a mercenary company that appeared out of nowhere before the clans were, you know, even really known to the Inner Sphere. They were largely here to scout the Inner Sphere and blah, 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 lots of stuff. But the most noteworthy aspect of the Wolf's Dragoons was that they showed up with Clan Tech. When the Inner Sphere had lost a lot of technology due to the Secession Wars. So anytime you see Wolf's Dragoons in, uh, in any of the descriptors of a mech, worth looking at um because that might have that might have some clan tech uh possibly like clan pharaoh or something in any case uh yeah i don't know why that one's orange that confuses me and then the locust 5w2 word of blake design oh yes C3 Slave, Guardian ECM, and a tag system with Indo and an Excel engine and Light Pharaoh. Double heat sinks. Oh, yeah. Loot pinata. In any case, uh, the next button goes to salvage. The left and right cycles between your different units. Now, just because the tank is showing here does not mean we did not lose it. But because Tainted Loki is showing here uninjured, that means he indeed was unharmed in the tank explosion. So, let's go ahead and look. Oh yeah, and also you can look through your mechs um, to see what exactly was done, but we took like minimal damage, so. I should have spent more time going over it. Um, whatever. Whenever we actually have a more significant damage profile to look through, we'll spend some time with that. But here, here is the salvage screen. In the top right corner, you will still see the pre-mission payout funds. That's important once we finish picking salvage, I'll show why. On the left over here, it shows you again, defend base mission, whoop de doo It shows your salvage agreement, two priority, nine total, and it reminds you, oh yeah, you went light on salvage here. And I swear that's just there so you can kick yourself whenever you see some really good stuff. So, this salvage always starts with the partial mech and vehicle salvage in alphabetical order. You can also click storage here to see what partial salvage you have floating around in the Argo, which is sortable by light, medium, heavy, and assault. It is not sortable by mech versus vehicle, but you can just tell if I had them, you would be able to see which ones were mech and which ones were vehicle. Now then, we don't need it, so we're going to put it away. I'll draw more attention to it once there is actually salvage to pay attention to over there. But for now, we're going to look through this particular salvage screen, and we're going to look at this over here. First thing to note is claimed salvage value zero sea bills. As you add things, this value will increase. Some situations, like this enforcer piece, we have no idea what it's valued at. So if we put it over here, we see that this enforcer piece is valued at 2.4 million C bills. This is not the sell or scrap value at all. This is if you were to go buy it in a store, this is the amount 
that would be base marked up by how much the faction liked or disliked you. I believe it's also calculated in with the scrap value of the part, which we'll get to once I have stuff to scrap further down the line. But um, it is not accurate because some mechs, for example, Omni mechs, scrap for a larger percentage of this value than most like standard mechs. The reason why is because they have built in engine cores, engines, gyros, etc. that are worth more. But this is an opportunity for me to point at the drop cost multiplier. So you can read in the description, the description this Enforcer 5DR has Pharo and Indo, or no, drops Pharo using Indo structure, uh, has double, double heat sinks, ERPBC, ER large, whatever. Quirk improved cooling jacket, cool. Drop cost multiplier, 1.04. So this enforcer costs 4% more C bills for the same exact equipment than an enforcer that would have a 1.0. Because again, this is starting off with higher tech. Meanwhile, um, Federated Commonwealth, so 0.96 there. Uh, I believe the drop multiplier is also based on the tonnage. So that's why these light mechs, these these very light mechs, are below one. But if they were primitive light mechs, they'd be even lower. Here we go. Icarus 2, like I said. Primitive mech. Drop cost multiplier, 0 0.8. So with the exact same equipment loadout, this Icarus 2 would cost 20% less than an Icarus 2 that had a 1 drop cost multiplier. So, as you get more and more tech, and better and better tech, and the value of your mechs and the stuff in them goes higher and higher, having a 20% saving on drop costs, once your drop costs are getting up to 50, 60, 70,000 C-bills, that's pretty significant. And, like I said, primitive mechs, if you want to go budget, if you want to save C-bills, that's the way to do it. But, as the first thing we're going to loot, no. No, we're not going to pick primitive as the first thing we loot. We're going to actually scroll past all of this, even though the maximum APC is very good. SRM6 Valiant has increased crit chance. LRM5 times 2, so you can fire indirectly. Uh, the tons of machine guns and a tag. Tag is so good. Early game. All you have to do is land the tag and your hit chance goes from negligible to high at very, very, very high. Especially if they have electronic warfare that's messing with you and you ping them with a... So, a tag, in addition to giving you just a raw bonus to hit, also sensor pings them, basically. So, you can have a considerably lower sensor check and still not have the sensor deb uh, no sensors debuff. Now then, we get to the equipment, which is the primary thing you should be focusing on after your first, second, third, etc. missions. Because you don't have the funding to successfully build a mech. And unless you negotiated for more salvage, you don't really have the ability to put together a full vehicle yet. Plus, most of the vehicles in early game half skull and one skull missions are going to be more like this wheeled scout. Terrible is what I mean. Versus the Maxim, which is actually a very respectable hover tank. Very respectable. So, if I had four pieces, I probably, if I had four primary picks, I probably would take the Maxim. Probably. Dropping an entire extra 50 ton unit on the battlefield, very valuable early game. But what's also valuable, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just bypass all of the weapons there's nothing particularly interesting, but anything out of the weapons that we get randomly in addition to our two priority picks will be appreciated because until you have a stockpile of at least some weapons you can stick in each type of slot, it's kind of whatever. That said, mm, that's an SRM-6 Valiant. Doubled crit chance is good, 
But, uh, so I absolutely need to take a minute, uh, at some point between these recording sessions to fully dive into the C3 changes. Because I know for a fact, based on what I've seen so far, C3 slaves do something in isolation. But the primary benefit is that if you give somebody C3 Master, they have bonuses based on how many C3 slaves there are feeding data. But it could also just be that a C3 slave shares electronic warfare stuff with other units that don't have electronic warfare stuff. I don't know. I really do need to look into it. it. It's on my list of things to do whenever I have time between stuff. Indosteel. As I said, as I said, the two most valuable picks that you can get very early on in the game is things that reduce tonnage expenditure and electronic warfare. Indosteel reduces your structure weight by 50%. On a medium mech, that's noticeable. That'll give you a couple extra tons to work with. On a light mech, it's negligible. On a 20 tonner, for example, it gives you less than one full ton. So, it's worth picking if you don't have endo on all of your medium mechs. And it's good to have spare in case your endo gets damaged and you have to replace it. That said, I'm still going to keep looking because I'm more interested in this. So, guarding ECMs. Looking at the recording time, I'm going to go into them in more detail when we go back to the mech bay between missions. Suffice to say for now, the reason that it was so hard to hit that Locust was because of its electronic warfare gear. And this was one of the things. So, yeah. Immediately taking that. Um, double heat sinks. There's, it's always good, especially when you have mechs like we do that are already running double heat sinks. It's always good to have some in spare for if they get crit or destroyed. But... I'm going to look around at what's, what else is on offer before I take them. In part because if I do ever find them in shops, you see the value. Yeah, they really are that cheap if you find them for sale in a shop. So, ideally, we would find a shop where we could buy a bunch of them to sit on. Plus, mid to late game, you're going to be replacing the, clan, or the heat sink doubles with other heat sinks that don't take three slots per. And you'll end up with a couple hundred just sitting around until you decide to sell them. Uh, jump jet's not interesting. The mask, to have a replacement in case one of our masks gets damaged. Maybe. Possibly. I did notice that the fail chance was far lower than it used to be. Which means it's actually a much better item early game than it used to be. Because we were actually able to have a 0% fail chance with, I think, 4 piloting. Cool. Cooling, whatever, standard cooling, standard fusion engine, standard structure, ammo, ammo, ammo. Okay. Like I said, I think I'm, I'm just going to take the double heat sinks just in case we lose one in one of the mechs that we're running doubles. Because you have to have 10 double heat sinks for your mech's engine to function with a double heat sink kit. If you're dropping an engine core like this 165, that means you have to have... Four double heat double heat sinks externally, outside of the engine, to be able to run a double heat sink kit with a 165 core. So until we have enough, that's a very good pickup. That said, I am still looking at the C3 slave. If I understood how it worked better, I would prioritize it. But until I actually understand how it works fully and can share with you how it fully works, 
just like going for sea bills instead of additional picks. I'd rather go for the thing that I know will be immediately useful in the near future. And until we have enough hit chance to reliably hit most of the six missiles, having that double crit chance isn't actually worth the dealing nine damage per missile instead of ten, I don't think. Like, that's, it's only six less damage, but when you have, you know, <laughs> when you have less than 100 damage Alpha Strike, and this is most of it, like, losing 6% of your damage to maybe get some crits, it's a really good system, though, and I really... Actually, hold on. Hold on a second. If memory serves, it has been a minute, but if memory serves, when we first looked at our mechs, the Bushwhacker, originally, before we put the Enhanced Stellar M in it, had two SRM4 Valiants. So this wouldn't just be a SRM6 Valiant in isolation. We could potentially, if we had a mech that had three hard point, uh, three missile hard points, we could potentially have SRM 14 Valiant. At which point, the odds of us critting an open enemy would be insanely high, and the odds of us shredding enough armor to start doing through armor crits even on fresh targets. Yeah, no, I'm actually going to take that. I'm actually, and that's worth noting, whenever you drop priority salvage, it does jump to the top. Don't be alarmed, just scroll back down to where you were. I am going to take that. In part because we do have the SRM-4 Valiants floating around, and I would love to build a SRM Valiant machine gun build. And I'm going to commit to it. So, we got a piece of the dart. Okay. We got a piece of the wield scout. Okay. Um, no, can't. Okay. The Large Laser Tronel, which is literally just a large laser that generates extra heat. It's bad. But we currently don't have literally anything that we could potentially replace it, uh, replace a the, the laser that's in... Well, I th think actually, yes, the Bushwhacker has a large laser and the... Phoenix Hawk has a pulse laser, large pulse laser, but we don't have replacements in case those get destroyed during a mission, so it's worth keeping around for now, also in part because its value is really low, and uh, it doesn't sell for much. We have a replacement LB-10 in case our LBX-10 autocannon on our Bushwhacker gets damaged or destroyed in such a way that we need another one. Cool. Replacement medium lasers, always nice to have. Internal combustion engine. This is bad. <laughs> so basically agri uh, agricultural mechs and industrial mechs are the kind that use engine in internal combustion engines. They're, um, they're bad. Unless you're wanting to make a Irby that is a turret that uses a lot of high heat weapons. But even then, I think it's a uh, fuel cell engines are better. But you, you have the engine core weighs twice as much. That's what X2 means. So if the core would normally weigh five tons, it now weighs 10 tons, which means when you're using an IC engine or a fuel cell engine, you just want to put the absolute tiniest core you have in so that that's negligible. Especially since the minus 20% walking distance doesn't apply if you can't move. Like, if you only have one hex of movement and one hex of sprinting, the minus 20% walking distance doesn't impact you at all. That said, if you have one hex of movement and one hex of sprinting, you're not generating evasion and, um, good luck. The bonus visibility and sensor signature means you can't benefit from stealth, really. Um, so you can't make an immobile stealth turret that doesn't get hit because of stealth. A, a plus two to sensor ping on stealth. Like, it's... It's so bad. So why would you ever use it? 
money. <laughs> you see the, it halves the coolant cost multiplier. So even if you put double heat sinks in the thing, you're still paying half the coolant cost that you would for a normal double heat sink build. Minus 40% heat generated by weapons fire. So you can put very hot weapons in and it will be able to run them with less heat sinks than a comparable, not terrible engine. But mostly it's the repair costs and the coolant costs that you're losing or that you're, you know, benefiting from. I am immediately going to sell this in part because if you see at the very bottom, the cargo cost, that 286 C bills, you're paying that every single financial report. So by keeping this in my, in my Argo, I would be losing almost 300 C bills every single financial report. And I have no plans to use it anytime soon, if ever. So the way that you directly sell something from the salvage screen is you hold down shift and you click it. But before I do that, I want to draw your attention to the funds at the top. Again, this is the amount of sea bills we had prior to launching on the mission. The sea bill payout that we saw on the first post mission briefing page has not been added to it yet. And when you sell an item directly from the salvage screen by holding down shift and clicking it, you'll see the one comma 119 turned into one comma 135 and some change. Anything you sell in the salvage screen immediately pops up. I don't know if you were paying attention to it or the corner, but it showed in orange the amount of sea bills I got from selling it. And you can see in the corner it has updated to show I actually got a decent chunk of sea bills from that internal combustion engine. Now then, Guardian UCM, so happy to have it. SRM6 Valiant, cool. Medium lasers, etc., etc., neat. Armor piercing machine gun ammo. So, if you are crit seeking, machine guns are really good for crit seeking once there is no armor left in the location because they really can't get through armor crits basically at all. Um, I believe if memory serves, the target has to be down to less than six armor in a location for machine guns to start, like base default boring intersphere machine guns to have a chance to get a through armor crit. So what armor piercing machine gun ammo does is it gives you something to do with your machine guns prior to the target being open. Now the downside is you do have less than 50, or you, you do reduce your crit chance by half. So if you are going to be able to get them open or get them almost open and maybe get a crit, you're having your crit chance. Also, if again, you manage to get them open and you're dealing damage to structure, you're having the damage you deal to structure. But if you're targeting a fresh target, the armor piercing ammo on the machine gun does increase your damage by 50%. But for most stock standard machine guns, that brings two damage times six up to three damage times six. So, I mean, it's not terrible. It has its uses, but honestly, if you're shooting machine guns at a fresh target, why? <laughs> Soften them up with somebody else first. Now, the SRM Valiant is definitely going to run machine guns. And I could see a world where I actually fire the machine guns before the SRM Valiant. Because the doubled crit chance also applies to through armor crits. And the SRM Valiant is going to be able to crit through more armor with a higher through armor crit chance than machine guns with armor piercing. 
They used to be, oh, just a quick little history lesson. Armor-piercing machine gun rounds used to be busted because they used to do damage directly to internals. And whenever you're doing damage directly to structure, you have a chance of critting, not even as a through armor crit, but just as a crit. So you used to be able to load up a ton of machine guns and just crit everything all the time. This is a much more reasonable result. And then another thing people were doing was using the minus 50% damage to structure before it had a penalty to crit chance to just more reliably crit instead of kill with machine gun shots. So the modders added the minus 50% chance to crit so that it has its one use that it's intended for. Shooting a fresh target. Now... I don't know if they also maybe added the ability to have a higher through armor crit threshold. Like, maybe instead of being able to crit through 6 max armor, now it's up to 12 or maybe even more. I don't know. I, uh, I haven't really looked into especially machine gun ammo in a while. Mostly because I, in my last couple of playthroughs I haven't been using Omnimex and it's really hard to include more than like one machine gun without Omni hard points. And uh, one machine gun past the early game is not enough, so. All right, and here we are in the final step of the post-mission returning to not in mission time. Yeah, I, I've been again recording for almost an hour and uh, it's past midnight. <laughs> so. Hey, at least we got through the first mission. All right, and finally we got to the last step in the post-mission resolution. And that is returning back to the Argo, getting the pop-up or pop-ups, and then resuming the overworld, in space, pre like between mission stuff. The, uh, the management side of the game. The first thing that you see here is mech repairs needed. If you click no, or if you reload the autosave that's generated after a mission, you will have to go in and manually add the armor back that was stripped. Even if you click yes, if something was crit, you will likely need to go in and manually repair the crits. But, since the only crits we took were the upper leg actuators because of the uh, mask crit that I... Yeah, that. I'm going to click yes, and then just remember that I need to go in and repair the upper legs. Now then, if the vehicle had been lost, if we had lost our tank, and at the end of the salvage screen, once we clicked confirm and got the random salvage... Tank parts would have been at the top. Our parts of our tank, whatever, whether it be one to however many the max salvage you need to build things is, would have been there, and we would have had to, you know, gather more parts to rebuild it. And whenever you exit the mission and get back to here, it would have popped up saying the Chalster was destroyed and could not be recovered. But since neither of those things happened, we can go to our mech bay as soon as it loads go to the vehicle bay, and there it is. And not only that, but there it is with full undamaged armor and structure ready to drop on our next mission. So while tanks, as you saw, can kind of blow up more easily than mechs, it's not usually as bad as when your mechs blow up. That and, I mean, it's a lot harder for your mech warriors to die in a tank unless you're literally just having the front destroyed. And uh, you can drop, you can drop tanks in the mech slots. So you can, at the start of the game, drop six tanks and just never have repair bills as long as they don't get, you know, completely destroyed and lost. But the second you lose one, again, if we go to the store, buying a new tank is a million C bills, and that's that's an AC two. AC-2 instead of AC-10. It does have a Blackwell machine gun instead of just a standard, but, um... Okay. 
And then it also has the Arian <laughs> bonus recoil. Yeah. Wait a second. Oh, wow. Okay. So the Arian SRMs used to reduce the chance to be hit by AMS for two recoil. But apparently instead now they have plus one hit point per missile. Which, against standard AMS, is better, arguably, because that one extra hit point means that the AMS has to hit the same missile one additional time. Then again, it's also better against high explosive ammo, because standard A uh, SRM ammo is three hit points. AMS, standard AMS plus high explosive ammo is three damage, so that's actually real. That's way better than the percent chance to not be hit. Wow. That's cool. Anyway, the point being, million C bills for the Vedette. Now, you'll see in the mech bay, <laughs> I'm almost to an hour, so I'm going to make this quick. You'll see in the mech bay, we have four mechs, all four of our mechs that dropped, being worked on. This is part of the reason why Mech Bay 2 is so important. Because we can go to manage tasks and we can see every mech took a little bit of damage. So if we bump that there, that's going to take two days. Currently, our Mech Bay 2 is not built. So in three days, our Mech Bay 2 will start working. But in those three days, we can finish repairing the Stealth and Locust completely. Then, with MechBay 2 operational but working at 50% efficiency, we can repair our Phoenix Hawk and our Bushwhacker in two days because the 50% efficiency MechBay 2 will finish the, two, uh, the one day worth of work in the two days the Phoenix Hawk takes. So, altogether, we're going to be back up and ready to rock in five days, which is perfectly fine. Because you'll see our mech warriors are fatigued for four days anyway. So we're only spending one additional day past our mech warriors fatigue recovery to repair our mechs. And that means we will definitely be able to drop on another mission. So checking engineering. Actually, you know what? I'll do all this management stuff next time. For now, that's been your episode of Rogue Tech for the day. I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, have a good one.